Thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar for, uh, from Interasma. Uh, I think uh, you enjoyed uh, the previous one and I'm sure we'll very much enjoy this one too. Uh, we are lucky today, we have uh, Professor Antoine Bourdin, uh, who is a respirologist uh, from the University of Montpellier in France at the Hospital Arnaud de Villeneuve. Uh, Antoine is a, a very renowned uh, researcher and clinician and is responsible for, uh, for many uh, research committees, uh, uh, particularly in Europe. And he's a well-known uh, international expert and speaker on asthma and related diseases. And we are lucky because he's also an expert on the consequences of uh, the use of oral corticosteroids in asthma and severe asthma and uh, other uh, topics related to this. So uh, thank you so much, Arnaud, for contributing to our webinars. And uh, uh, this is to you now. Thank you. So many thanks for this so kind introduction, uh, Louis-Philippe. It's a pleasure to, to discuss today my probably uh, the my favorite topic on, uh, on asthma, which is oral corticosteroids. Uh, I have uh, many, um, uh, just tell me with Philippe, my sharing is working well. Yes, it's, uh, it's okay now. Yeah. Okay, I have plenty of uh, disclosures because I'm involved in uh, most of the randomized controlled trials aiming at developing new, new therapeutics in asthma and COPD. When I'm doing the clinic, the first thing I, uh, I'm always uh, recognizing is the burden of the disease. And I love this paper coming from the Ellen Redel's team, um, talking about the, which, uh, of the, which are the main uh, issues patients are facing with severe asthma. And if you look at these smaller summaries, you see that the, the, probably the first thing is related to side effects of cortisone uh, and, uh, and the risk of osteoporosis. The control of breathing that is very often impaired with the, the feeling of panic, and this can be clearly worsened by steroids. And in the end, uh, probably the, the loss uh, of self-esteem, the sense of achievement and all of these can be probably affected by oral corticosteroids, especially when they are taking on the long term. And the same patients are usually asking the same question, why do I have asthma? Uh, and until now, I think what we could uh, gather is all the uh, evidence coming from pathology. The first thing relates to eosinophils and their related charcolate and crystals that are probably involved into most of the, um, of the biology of, uh, of severe asthma, but also of most of the uh, clinical uh, manifestation of the disease. The epithelium, the epithelium sorry, is clearly uh, uh, not working correctly. Um, there's a clear dysregulation with an uh, uh, epithelial, I would call it hyperreactivity. And this also leads to uh, goblet cell hyperplasia, enlargement of the submucosal glands, uh, and in the end, the massive mucus plugging that we, we can see in the eruptive form of, as of asthma, such as uh, near fatal asthma, for example. So what we have seen is that in the end, if we have just a brief summary, patients are complaining of steroids. The pathology tells us that there's mucus and eosinophils, which are mostly steroid sensitive. And in the end, if you consider the journey of a patient with difficult asthma, you see that uh, what is recommended in, in everywhere is to have some diagnosis consolidation, an issue on adherence, a look at comorbidities before saying it is severe asthma. And once you see that it is severe asthma, the phenotyping aims at seeing where you can bring the patient to. And you see that oral corticosteroids is becoming the smallest option, really a very, very small option everywhere. But if you consider the story exact, and, uh, and I uh, changed the picture we generated in 2012, it's full of oral corticosteroids everywhere. 
when asthma is difficult, it's probably the, the place where patients are taking the most uh, of oral corticosteroids because, because of, the under, of the misunderstanding of the diagnosis very often, the misunderstanding of the symptoms, and the uh, uh, confusion very often between shortness of breath, exacerbation, etc. And everywhere you see steroids, poor adherence to inhaled corticosteroids will lead you to increase the rate of exacerbation. And comorbidities, not only uh, related to oral corticosteroids, but the comorbidities related to T2 inflammation, such as nasal polyposis, for example, atopic dermatitis or any other, eosinophilic esophagitis will lead you to have oral corticosteroids. And these corticosteroids are also blurring you, the way you go um, uh, to the step of phenotyping and eventually to be eligible to any biologic. So in the end, the pathway from difficult to uh, the management of severe asthma is full of oral corticosteroids everywhere. And this is probably what we don't want to see anymore. And we have a lot to do because we are the super champions of oral corticosteroids. In France, we are called the pulmonologists managing asthma are called steroid doctors because we are giving steroids everywhere. And when I was a junior, I was told to give steroids in asthma, in acute exacerbation of COPD, in sarcoidosis, in IPF, uh, in lung cancer, uh, more or less everywhere. So if you see here the data set of patients taking short, middle, or long-term oral corticosteroids in France, when the indication can be identified in the, in the database registry, you see that obstructive pulmonary diseases are clearly the most frequent cause. Uh, in this uh, analysis of the uh, 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 database uh, of uh, claim insurance in France in 2012, we identified uh, the population of severe asthmatics based on the refilling of at least 10 times a year of uh, a fixed combination of ICS LABA at high doses. There are very few other diseases where you will really refill 10 times a year uh, 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 a fixed combination. You see that 60% of severe asthmatics were taking oral corticosteroids and they had at least 3.3 deliveries per year, which means more than uh, two grams were uh, at least disposable uh, at home. It doesn't necessarily indicate that they are taking it, but at least they bought it at the, at the pharmacist. You see that in a much uh, population, but free of any use of inhaled corticosteroids, the, the mean delivery of inhaled corticosteroids is 1.8 box. A box is 20 pills of 20 milligrams in France. So can you realize how these uh, drugs are prescribed and, uh, and present in the home pharmacy? Very often when we are discussing about that, people tell me, oh, but it's an old story. These, these are old data, old change now. But it's not totally true. You see that in this survey in 2017, the use of oral corticosteroids of high OCS users in asthma is not only declining, but also still uh, very high, but a little bit increasing even in, in Germany. You see that in Germany, we have data coming from pulmonologists and from GP, and it is time to stop to charge too much primary care physician. You see that we are, <coughs> apologize, uh, that we are prescribing more OCS than the GPs. Why are we giving so much oral corticosteroids? This is a real question. And is it working so well in asthma? The gold study was interesting, and I love coming back in this paper of 2004, where the aim was really to understand what is the real potency of corticosteroids to, um, to really change the history of asthma. And in this, uh, in this uh, study, patients were um, proposed to take uh, uh, fixed combination of uh, corticosteroids and LABA. 
and progressively the dose was increased until patients could be controlled as a surrogate of the power, of the potency of corticosteroids to really control asthma. And you see that the result was that it can work more or less in 80% of asthmatics. Um, you see that for most patients, 68% were to receive the maximal dose. It was interesting because patients were well paid for uh, doing this, uh, this study. And if they were not taking the, the, the medication, they were uh, excluded from the trial. So we can speculate that the adherence to the treatment was not too bad. So it's really a proof of concept of the real potency of corticosteroids. And you see here how many patients are uh, requiring something else than inhaled corticosteroids. And it's around 20%, something like that. And you see that when inhaled corticosteroids were still not sufficient with the LABA to reach control, patients were suggested to take a short burst of oral corticosteroids to really go until the end of the proof of concept of, of the steroid sensitivity of asthma. And you see that they could gain uh, half of them with the oral corticosteroids. So in the end, and this is a clear message, very important, I guess, um, if you have not uh, uh, a very, very severe asthma, ICS Labafix combination can control around 80% of, of asthmatics. More or less, this is the re reason why we are giving so much steroid. And you see that one year after, it's the same study, the same patient, but seen one year later, among those who were quite well or totally controlled in uh, uh, dark gray or, uh, or black, uh, about 15% lost control, and this is eventually related to poor adherence or loss of adherence. But you see that for those who were still not controlled at the end of the, the first year, they were still in control the year after. So there's really a small proportion of asthmatics between 20 to 30 percent who can't be totally well controlled with uh, uh, ICS LABA. And these are probably the patients who were receiving, in 2004, there were no such real drug available. These are probably those who were receiving oral corticosteroids. We are also giving oral corticosteroids in acute exacerbations. This is uh, good. We have to do that because it works. You see that we are it is preventing admission after an ED attendance in nearly half of the situation. So it is quite logical to consider that oral corticosteroids are the treatment of exacerbation, but we can probably challenge that uh, in the future by dissecting a little bit uh, more what is an asthma exacerbation first. And second, and this is the most important, by preventing exacerbation, we will prevent the requirement of our, uh, oral corticosteroids. What is also very clear from that is that not all patients are doing severe exacerbation requiring oral corticosteroids. This study is very well known and very clear cut design, showing that patients who are doing a lot of exacerbations, usually, in general, uh, statistically, are those with the greatest levels of eosinophils. And it makes sense that we are giving a lot of corticosteroids to these patients. So uh, somewhere, the, this is closing the circle. You have a severe asthma because you have a lot of eosinophils and you are receiving a lot of corticosteroids. And if you consider that uh, at steady state, very few patients are eosinophilic, um, you see here in this uh, uh, sputum study, 17%. Actually, this is not true. If you consider what is happening in, during an exacerbation, if you consider the mix and eosinophilic, 86% of patients are likely to have eosinophil in their airways. So finally, my, my purpose is that finally, most severe asthma patients have T2 inflammation, and this is why they are um, receiving so much corticosteroids. So you have to understand and this is probably one key uh, paper in the field, why we are uh, 
giving steroids to uh, block eosinophilic airway inflammation. And this is probably one of the most beautiful things of the recent developmental uh, 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 improvement we had uh, in the uh, pharmacology of asthma. If you consider what is happening in the, in, in the airways of patients who are receiving steroids or a placebo, you see that steroids are decreasing the number of T cells, this is expected. The number of eosinophils, this is what we wanted. Also a little bit those of uh, mast cells. And this is related to the decrease of two key cytokines of asthma in the T2 inflammation, IL-5 and IL-4. And all of you know that these are now the, the targets of the new monoclonal antibodies we have. So it makes sense to understand that finally, the new monoclonal antibodies are just reproducing what corticosteroids are doing and limit, limiting, by the way, the risk of having uh, off-target uh, effects related to, to steroids. We are keeping the good and, and, and uh, and uh, uh, forgetting the bad somewhere. The question of refractory eosinophil is uh, challenging because uh, you see in this study with triamcinolone uh, given uh, uh, sub-Q uh, that there are no real refractory eosinophil in the, in the airways for patients who are uh, eventually not taking well their treatment or who have very particular uh, pharmacology. Actually, all patients who have eosinophil can be targeted by uh, uh, steroids, sometimes with uh, amazing amounts. And maybe this is why also these patients should receive um, uh, drugs that are uh, most potent. Uh, and this is probably why also uh, some can be uh, I would like to say saved by, by uh, monoclonal antibodies. It's not always true. If you consider what is really T2 asthma, you can combine the, the uh, uh, gene expression measurement that has been called T2GM. It, it, it's a mean of the, the, the combination of a few genes related to T2 inflammation. And what is interesting is this study is that this expression in the sputum has been assessed in healthy controls, you see here, and pre and post corticosteroids. And you see that it's an artificial threshold of 3.5 that has been fixed to say which are the T2 high and which are the T2 low genes. And if you uh, consider that, um, corticosteroids are mostly fighting against the uh, T2 markers. You see that there are still some that are steroid resistant, uh, uh, more or less. And then this is probably new potential targets for us. But if you consider here, you see that there's no uh, so great differences between non-severe asthma and severe asthma in terms of T2 ratio. Sparing oral corticosteroids and sparing sabayuse uh, were already major aims in 1973 when you could publish in the BMJ with 20 patients. You see that this was the aim of, uh, of uh, beclometazone aerosol. And very interestingly, you see that the beclometazone aerosol was already able to uh, reduce the impact of. Uh, the, the requirement, sorry, for OCS uh, um, uh, taken uh, as a maintenance treatment. It's interesting because steroids were developed just after World War II, which means that uh, um, we needed around 25 years to develop the use of oral corticosteroids to save asthmatics. And we are trying to get rid of these same oral corticosteroids for now 50 years. So 25 years to establish oral corticosteroids, 50 years to get rid of it. And interestingly, uh, it's not so old. In 1992, you see that very famous uh, uh, key opinion leaders in asthma were suggesting that corticosteroid induced osteoporosis was present in severe menstrual asthma. And what I love is the subtitle here, very, very uh, cautious, I would say, 
steroid firing drugs may be useful. It was not a certainty at this time. So side effects of oral corticosteroids are very clear. I won't spend too much time recalling them, but you see that it's, uh, it's obvious that we know and we can't say that we don't know. We know very well that oral corticosteroid, if they are fantastic drugs, all what I said just before, it's working well. And, uh, we didn't know why, but now we know. But we know also very well which are the side effects, and uh, they are all just here in front of you. No one wants to have any of these side effects. There's no mild side effects here in this list. These are all horrible side effects. And they start very early in the use of oral corticosteroids. Uh, very often I present this, this um, scattergram because uh, it, it focuses on two important side effects of oral corticosteroids, type 2 diabetes and osteoporosis. And you see that the significance in terms of increased risk of the side effect with oral corticosteroid starts as soon as 0.5 gram uh, for both osteoporosis and type 2 diabetes. It means that you're increasing your risk by 30% and, and 40% here of having uh, type 2 diabetes and osteoporosis as soon as you take 0.5 gram per year, which is very small. It's one exacerbation, more or less. 0.5 gram is 10 days at 50 milligram. It might be, it might fit maybe with more with Two exacerbation, but still it's very uh, rapidly uh, uh, achieved, and uh, and it's easy to recall. And it's a way of discussing with all our primary care colleagues, with the patients themselves, with pharmacies, with all the community. One gram is red flag. 0.5 gram is uh, is orange flag for patient with no uh, previous. Uh, 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 comorbidity, but for patients who already have risk factor or comorbidity, 0.5 gram is, is, uh, is unacceptable. If you already have uh, osteoporosis, if you're overweighted, receiving 0.5 gram is probably uh, unacceptable. Obviously, uh, managing these comorbidities will uh, be extremely expensive for, uh, at the present, but also in the future. And this is probably how um, sparring OCS can be uh, cost, effect cost effective despite the very uh, limited cost of uh, oral corticosteroids themselves. And another notion that not all have is that um, OCS use, chronic OCS use, is a cause of uh, premium, premature uh, death. And, and this is a very uh, uh, uncommon message, if you have a severe asthma treated daily with oral corticosteroids, you will uh, you have a reduced length of uh, life expectancy. You see in this uh, small survey of 52 patients followed for 20 years by uh, my friend Pascal Chanez in, uh, in Montpellier when, uh, when he was uh, where I am now, uh, you see that uh, over 20 years, uh, we uh, uh, unfortunately recorded uh, half uh, of the community uh, dying of uh, fatal asthma, uh, but, also, but mostly from uh, other causes. You see that for those who stay alive, the prognosis was not beautiful before the development of new, new treatments. And this was further confirmed in different studies, but you see that here, in, a, in an epidemio pharmacoepidemiological survey, the time to death for corticosteroid dependent asthmatics was uh, uh, clearly reduced uh, when compared to uh, steroid independent asthmatics, very clearly. So, the development of an OCS stewardship on the model of antibiotics has been proposed. And uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, the, the idea is really to share information with patients who are poorly aware of the side effects of oral corticosteroid. Uh, and it makes sense if you go to the, to the primary care because you're having an asthma exacerbation, 
will the doctor spend more time to convince the patient to, to have oral corticosteroids to prevent a bad uh, uh, event to occur, for example, emergency department or uh, hospitalization? Or, or will he spend more time to say, I'm prescribing you 10, year, 10 days of steroids, but be aware that you will uh, face a lot of side effects in the future. So we are not really well educating and not very well sharing the data about the real uh, uh, side effects of oral corticosteroid. So the idea is to make it clearer now and to use uh, OCS only when clinically justified at the lowest dose possible to taper as soon as possible, to monitor the use and the adverse effects closely, and to educate both patients and physicians on risks. And it works. We know that for patients who are taking less steroids than they used to take before, the risk of side effects is decreasing. We have very few longitudinal uh, uh, trials showing that it's very complex and very long to um, to imagine, but we have some data coming from registries, once again from uh, from uh, uh, pharmacy data claim. And you see here that in patients who could uh, not uh, use OCS anymore, the risk of OCS-related adverse effects decreased considerably after one year. You see, for example, the risk of having a, a, a bone fracture decreased uh, if you used it less than uh, uh, more than one year ago, and the same everywhere, you see that the, the, the risk, the odd ratio are decreasing with time. And, and from my point of view, the less well identified side effects of oral corticosteroids are the effect on our uh, brain. It looks more and more in my clinic, in my personal experience, but also in patients' reports, that patients are not really comfortable with these drugs that are uh, very addictive, actually, and, uh, um, but also very uh, stressful. Uh, I don't know exactly which words are the best, but all patients are describing very personal experiences with, uh, with steroid births or with long-term oral corticosteroids. You see here some uh, uh, quotes from uh, different patients uh, reported in different publications. And I think it's really interesting to consider that actually probably one of the key barriers in uh, stopping or winning uh, oral corticosteroids is more in the brain than in the adrenal glands. We will uh, discuss this a little bit further. We had an interesting survey in France in a, uh, in a web-based community of severe asthmatics, and we asked them what was their perception related to oral corticosteroids. Uh, it's interesting because this community is very active. They want, they, they are, uh, really interested in to participating in to uh, research. Sorry again. <coughs> they were all adults. And uh, there were some patients taking long-term oral corticosteroids, but most had only experiences with short-term because of exacerbation. And you see that the two first things that came, it was a negative image. You see here, largely uh, uh, most frequent in long-term that uh, short-term but usually negative, very often ambivalent. And when we ask them which are the two key points from uh, your understanding of oral corticosteroids, you see that secondary effects came first before the treatment efficacy, which is clearly interesting. And you see that efficacy just overtook uh, 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 secondary effects in short-term users only. So an interesting story that patients are having a quite a negative image, but also a strong image of efficacy. They're very uh, ambivalent often. And then we asked them, what would you do if you were prescribed long-term oral corticosteroids for your asthma? And in general, and this is really interesting, they said that they, would, they wouldn't take it actually. They would look for alternative treatment. They would look for information, sure. 
They would seek advice from another healthcare professional, and this is important to recall. Nomadi medical nom nomadism, we call it in France, is very frequent in difficult asthma, and this is probably related to um, issues related to overuse of oral corticosterone. They would prefer to delay starting treatment. They would talk with patients who have taken oral corticosteroid. They would talk with family and friends, etc., etc. So uh, uh, the interest of this survey is to show that finally uh, we are prescribing a lot of oral corticosteroids. They can be available in most countries over the counter. Um, I, I'm interested to hear from the audience how many of you are allowing the use of oral corticosteroids in your written action plan. Very often it's 50-50. Uh, But in the end, patients are doing what they want. And very often they're doing, uh, ac according more from the family, uh, friends, uh, from media, from uh, web-based uh, data rather than from their uh, doctors. And this is important to recall in the way we have to, 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 uh, to progress in the way we are uh, uh, using oral corticosteroids with uh, reason and with caution, with caution, yes. So the call to action, together, we can change everything. Protect patients from uh, overexposure to OCS, and this is not so easy. Uh, because serious adverse effects, because the increased healthcare cost, obviously the new therapies are emerging, but this is not the only thing. Uh, and, and the OCS firing strategies, we will discuss about that. We conducted a, a large uh, Delphi uh, where most of the import, uh, most of the of the key researchers in asthma uh, participated in uh, last year. It was a four-round uh, Delphi survey, a very strong. Uh, and large uh, exercise uh, because the first thing was uh, just to ask questions about what would be your uh, main questions about uh, uh, oral corticosteroids and asthma and we received more than uh, 1500 uh, uh, proposition and it was uh, very complex to sort them and to uh, well ask the, the good questions We uh, uh, included experts who were managing patients on a weekly basis, have clinical experience in managing asthma with oral corticosteroids, and were not uh, belonging to a pharmaceutical company. And we identified, uh, we identified, sorry, uh, five main domains: the appropriate OCS use for the treatment of asthma, the tapering how to manage related adverse effects, manage adrenal insufficiency, and the need for future research. And we agreed that uh, on this topic that uh, exacerbation should be treated no longer than seven days and that the, the dose should not be more than 0.5 milligram per kilo per day, which largely reduces actually the, the dose we used uh, to give uh, formerly. When I was a, a junior, my, uh, my mentor, Professor Philippe Godard, was telling me an exacerbation is 120 milligram 10 days. So uh, we are very far from there. The agreement was not reached uh, uh, on, uh, and this shows, and, and this is very interesting because it shows all the work we have to perform before really uh, uh, succeeding in uh, In, in decreasing the use of oral corticosteroid. Um, what, uh, uh, whether the, the short course of OCS uh, should remain stable or not, many, many of uh, the experts were uh, reporting a progressive declining dose, uh, three days at 0.5 milligram, three days at 0.25, and three last days at, uh, uh, at a very small dose, such as 10 milligram per day. Others were uh, not doing that, etc. And uh, the, the, the individual tailoring of short court OCS dose would render systematic application of ideal doses unlikely. 
uh, maybe we can't uh, 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 generalize uh, this kind of question every uh, uh, systematically and maybe it's not required. We also uh, uh, agreed upon the fact that if we consider that there's an, an appropriate OCS maintenance dose, it is a maximum of five milligram. You see that we achieved the, the agreement as soon as the first round of the Delphi process. 10 milligram was uh, really not uh, uh, consensual. So clearly only the five milligram is acceptable and it should be less. It's a bit different than what was in Gina at this stage where it was 7.5, but it's clear that, sorry again, <coughs> that 7.5 is usually the threshold above which we can consider that it is not given for supplementing adrenal insufficiency, but for treating uh, really asthma. And we also uh, uh, strongly agreed upon the fact that tapering should be attempted in all asthma patients, regardless of comorbidities. This is very important message. You all know the very uh, virtu uh, 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 virtuous circle of uh, GINA where you assess, you uh, you, you manage and you assess again, and you assess again. And, uh, and this is a key question. Why do you see your asthma patient every three months or every six months? If it's just to measure lung function, probably this is marginally useful because you won't change everything just because of an FTP1 value. So the management of asthma should be very dynamic. This is a real message. Uh, no one should say five milligram is perfect. You have it for 10 years, so you will have it for the next 10 years. This is important to recall. And you see that it was very uh, uh, con consensual, consensual, sorry, upon all the experts involved in this, uh, in this Delphi exercise. The rhythm and the speed of OCS tapering requires individualization for each patient. This is important to recall. We can try to identify good algorithm for uh, tapering or for stopping all corticosteroids, but, but individualization is probably required in most. And this means that some expertise is required. And I'm not sure that we can really transfer this competence to endocrinologists or to any other um, specialty because uh, very often the symptoms that can relapse during the tapering can be misinterpreted as a relapse of asthma, whereas if you are a very good asthma specialist, you can consider what is asthma and what is not asthma during this uh, critical phase. What was non-consensual uh, during the, the, the Delphi was the, the speed of tapering. We uh, uh, agreed that it shouldn't exceed five milligrams per week, that uh, it should incorporate every other day OCS reduction was not that clear. And we don't know from endocrinologists if it's a good or a, or a bad idea. And that uh, the tapering should be gradual by reducing uh, the OCS dose by 30 to 50% every two to four weeks. More or less, this is how the, the Ponente uh, tapering scheme has been uh, established. You see uh, uh, on the light gray on the right, um, you see that for patients who were taking, for example, 20 milligrams per day, this protocol suggested to reduce uh, by five milligrams um, during the first week, and I turned that by five milligram uh, every two weeks. And after that, uh, when the dose is reached around 7.5, to decrease by 2.5 every two, uh, two weeks, and once at five milligram per day, reducing the dose by 2.5 uh, milligram per day every four weeks. So probably a quite slow scheme, very cautious, gentle for your adrenal glands to let them sufficient time to recover and to uh, um, 
to restore an, endocrine, uh, an endogenous secretion of, uh, of steroids. During this Delphi, we also agreed upon something that is poorly uh, performed in the routine practice, is the monitoring of OCS-related adverse uh, events. Uh, growth is usually very well monitored in, uh, uh, in uh, children, but for glycemic control, and all of us say that HB1AC should be measured at least every six months, maybe uh, every three months, Bone density using uh, 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 bone, uh, 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 how, how do you say, absorptiometry, uh, blood pressure, uh, cataracts, glaucoma, weight change, and the fracture risk score. All these were clearly uh, consensual among the, the panelists. So I do recommend you that if you have patients taking more than 0.5 grams a year or one gram a year, as births or as maintenance, but also as births, please um, uh, incite pa your patients to do these examinations. You will discover poorly symptomatic, but very significant comorbidities. And as always, preventing is better than treating. So there are many questions on the science of uh, biologics. I think there's a real clinical science of initiating biologics. And if you understand well the question, you will probably answer better to the question. And uh, as I very often uh, say to my students and my young colleagues in my department, endotyping, so measuring pheno or blood EOS, putum EOS, all what you want, biomarker is very easy. You just prescribe, you repeat and you wait the results. But understanding well what the patient is uh, expecting and what you can really offer is probably most challenging. And this is requiring more time and more expertise. And remember also what we really are able to achieve with our biologics. Improving FEV1 is definitely not the same thing that reducing exacerbation and clearly uh, not very well related to reducing uh, uh, shortness of breath uh, on exertion, and it's probably very different that not going back to ICU. So you have uh, outcomes related to uh, uh, asthma and other related to what has been proven with the different drugs we have. In the end, uh, when you want to stop OCS, you have to think about uh, adrenal insufficiency. And you see that during this consensus, uh, uh, very poor consensus was obtained, was achieved regarding how to manage adrenal insufficiency. We all agreed upon the fact that we should uh, assess for it, that if intolerable symptoms occur, we should return to the previous dose irrespective of any test of uh, stimulation, uh, I don't know if you call it synactin or uh, rapid ACTH, uh, HCTH test, but we, we all agreed uh, on the fact that the clinic is better than the biology for managing adrenal insufficiency. But for all the rest, we were unable to reach a consensus, despite the fact that there were a lot of endocrinologists in this uh, in this. Uh, Delphi exercise. Uh, for uh, uh, clinical practice, there's a, uh, an easy to recall uh, uh, word, uh, high stakes, to remember all the clinical features of uh, adrenal insufficiency for hypotension, uh, inability to mount stress response, generalized weakness, aches, pains, hypoglycemia, etc. You got it here. So remember that this is very uh, useful for your daily practice. Who are at risk of uh, uh, adrenal insufficiency when tapering all corticosteroids, when the course is recent, and especially if it was long or prolonged, when the course uh, uh, um, um, 
uh, was uh, as long as one year without any uh, stopping, uh, when the dose was high, uh, when uh, the dose were repeated, especially in the evening. Remember that we are picking our activity in the morning and we have the lowest activity in the evening. So when you give steroids in the evening, you are totally disturbing the, the chronobiology of the adrenal gland. And there are also some genetic background, etc., uh, exposing you to uh, greatest risk of uh, adrenal insufficiency. So this is the, the proposed uh, algorithm for uh, testing the risk of adrenal insufficiency uh, used uh, in the uh, in the Ponente uh, trial. Uh, uh, this is very uh, clear and uh, very simple to, to do. As I said, it's not very consensual even in endocrinologists, but still it's, it's there. And it has been well, uh, well assessed during the Ponente trial. I'll show the, the result just after. All the, resu all the other things we have to work on regarding OCS tapering, the delivery of asthma care, the use of biologic, uh, which kind of supplementation, etc. So regarding uh, adherence, the phenosuppression can be useful. I will go faster because I'm a bit late, but uh, we can use a phenosuppression test. If the patient is not suppressing pheno while treated, it is very highly likely that he's not using uh, inhaled corticosteroids. Remember of the placebo effect. This is very important when managing severe asthma patients taking too much oral corticosteroid. Remember that when you give albuterol, you are improving uh, FEV1, whereas when you give placebo albuterol or sham acupuncture, nothing occurs. But in terms of subjective improvement, there's no difference between albuterol, placebo, and sham acupuncture. So always remember that when patients are complaining of too much symptoms, especially if they are never experiencing any kind of exacerbation. Another important thing to remember during the clinic when managing patients taking too much oral corticosteroids, the regular sabayus is worsening uh, airway hyperreactivity. This is probably one key reason for failure in some patients. And do not forget that high doses of oral of uh, inhaled corticosteroids are, um, are uh, also contributing to uh, uh, the systemic diffusion of uh, steroids. You see that in this analysis, 63 to 68 percent of the of the of the effect of inhaled corticosteroids are actually related to their uh, systemic absorption. The Ponente trial showed that uh, it is possible to achieve uh, OCS reduction, as you see here. Uh, if we aim at being below 5 milligrams, you see that it can work in 91% of patients. And the risk of adrenal insufficiency uh, is quite important. You see that it's uh, nearly 25% of patients. So this is a, a French plan for uh, uh, reducing the risk of oral corticosteroids, identify patient, initiate the tapering, irrespective of anything else. Do not forget the psychological support, screen for adrenal insufficiency, initiate OCS sparring therapy, and this is not only biologic, but it is very often biologic. And please do not forget to assess the response. So in conclusion, sorry, I've been a bit long. Uh, forget the steroid doctor, we used to be. Obviously, OCS are given because it works, because it's cheap, because it's available, etc. Because T2 inflammation is steroid sensitive in the vast majority of patients, but there are probably 15 to 20% of patients who are taking oral corticosteroids, whereas their asthma is not driven by T2 inflammation. Dissociating asthma from corticosteroids is now achievable but we have to fight against history, culture, and, uh, and many beliefs in the general population. And we have to speak about the, the risk of overuse, especially when 
uh, when given in the written action plan, and they underappreciated side effects, in particular the, the addiction that personally I consider as the main uh, barrier to pass through. We have many options to fight against oral corticosteroids. Regarding the stopping, it's easier not to start, obviously, and this is very important for new patients. I think stopping OCS needs and requires expertise because there are real concerns regarding adrenal insufficiency. It's a, it's a real danger. Then you have uh, some expertise uh, to uh, manage uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, scenario. Thank you so much. Sorry for, for having been so long. Well, thank you so much, uh, Arnaud, for this uh, very comprehensive overview of the topic. I think uh, we have a few questions for you. Uh, I will start with the uh, first one here. Um, how do you explain the large dose reduction of OCS in the placebo arm of biological trails, as we see? Uh, is it due to the previous overuse of OCS in this patient, a low adherence to the ICS or something else? Um. There are three uh, studies I have in, in, in my mind uh, regarding this question, very, very important question. The first one is uh, uh, the, the Zonda trial, where the tapering was uh, supervised by a previously established algorithm. So at each visit, if patients were not with a too strong fall in their FEV1, and not too much worsening of their symptoms, the, the, the investigator was asked to, to taper the OCS dose. And, and you see the, the curve where it's decreasing and suddenly there's a clear cut gap between the treatment and the placebo arm and the patient from the placebo arm had to re-increase their dose, showing that certainly there's a placebo effect. And when you want to decrease, you succeed in decreasing, but, after, but at one moment you can't lie this disease is really a systemic disease, an extremely inflammatory disease, very relying on OCS. This is not in their head, it's, it's true. The second uh, story I have is the Venture trial, where dupilumab was used to uh, wean patients with maintenance oral corticosteroid. The placebo effect is nearly 40% of the dose, which is massive. It's less than in the... the it's less than in the, the, the treated arm, obviously. But interestingly, in this placebo arm, the exacerbation rate increased when compared to the, to the baseline value, which shows that if you really want to decrease the, the OCS dose, you can, but you will have to pay for it. And in the end, the cumulative dose at the end of the year is, is more than, than with the daily dose. Mm. And the third, the third interesting study we have is source, uh, a study with tezepelumab, which failed to achieve its first component. Actually, it worked very well in all patients with T2 markers, with high T2 markers, and it failed because of the low T2 group where they could be totally weaned from oral corticosteroids, both in the placebo and in the treated arm. And this probably indicates that these patients were taking oral corticosteroids, not for the good reason, but probably for the bad reasons. Yeah, I think I agree with you. And for the source study, I think there was a different methodology for the weaning of OCS compared to some other studies. I think they, they had many chances to, to, to reduce the dose of OCS. So maybe they had a, a better chance, those on placebo, to, to be weaned off. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. And I, I will mix two questions here that I have. Um, it, it is for patients with asthma that is uncontrolled with uh, an ICS, a high dose ICS plus a LABA. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, do you think uh, adding uh, or well, giving a tr triple therapy with a, an antimuscarinic drug, anticholinergic drug is mandatory before the talk, speaking about uh, using biologics? Uh, or do we have to further push the dose of ICS in some cases? And what is the maximum dose, for example? So this is a, a matter of management of these patients. It's an excellent question. Very often, the addition of a LABMA uh, is performed to manage some time, to organize the next clinic, 
to see whether you can change adherence, maybe change the device, see if the addition of the llama will improve a little bit something around the exacerbation rates, the symptoms, maybe the, the FEV1. And, and it is the occasion to not to start the, the biologic too fast, I would say, because once again, the, the path away from this situation, poorly controlled asthma to severe asthma treated with biologic, should, should be quite careful because it's not because one day everything looks so full that it will be the case forever first and because adherence is a real issue. So maybe it is also the occasion to test different ways of uh, optimization of adherence. I think the new opportunity given to uh, uh, connected devices the story of the phenosuppression are interesting new ways of thinking uh, uh, to adherence. So it's not mandatory. I think it's just a way of managing asthma before the biologic. It's not absolutely mandatory, but I think it's clever to do it like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a few questions. Uh, do you believe really in the risk of cardiovascular disease with OCS in asthmatic patient, or is it on a, related to underlying other conditions such as smoking associated with that and not to the OCS? Or what is the mechanism you think underlying that? What is interesting is that we tested whether it's dependent or independent of high blood pressure and diabetes, and it looks to be unrelated, to be independent. So it seems that you can have an increased risk of cardiovascular side effects independent of diabetes and high blood pressure. I went to the French Society of Cardiology to see how they consider this data. Is it strong? Is it mild? When compared to sleep apnea syndrome, for example, very common for, for us as a risk factor for increased vascular risk. And they were very surprised. It's not in the shad vasc risk. It's nowhere in the different uh, uh, risk score for, uh, for cardiovascular disease. And they told me that they will examine this more in depth to, uh, to assess whether it should be included in the, in the, in the global risk for uh, cardiovascular uh, events. So my feeling is that there are probably some effects of the corticosteroids on the endothelial cell that are promoting probably uh, clotting and, uh, and atheromask uh, deposition, irrespective once again of... Uh, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and uh, high blood pressure. Very interesting. Uh, very short question. Uh, do you, is there still room for the alternate days OCS uh, use as in the past, for example, one day off, one day on? My, uh, my mentor used to do that. I never did it. So uh, this is very personal. Um, during the Delphi, there's, there was no consensus. Some endocrinologists were strongly advocating for and the others very against. Yeah, it's probably the cumulative uh, weekly dose, or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't I know. Uh, there was a question about uh, the use of uh, biologics for the winning of uh, oral corticosteroid. This was a very large question. I think that you touched on that uh, today. Uh, so uh, there were some questions in regard to when to start the weaning uh, and how long, but I think you, you mentioned very clearly it has to be adapted to the, the patient and uh, monitoring uh, side effects such as adrenal insufficiency, I guess. Yeah. Do, do not hesitate to send me an email if we don't have time uh, uh, for, for the audience. Huh? Do not hesitate. I will give you all the, the, the references I cited today. Last minute, uh, there was a question, but I don't know. We touched mostly adult asthma today, but there was a question, is there still a role for OCS in, in severe asthma in children? It, it shouldn't. So what I can say is that personally, I consider it shouldn't. I think children are clearly the most vulnerable uh, population of asthmatics in front of oral corticosteroids. Biologics are beautifully working in, in, in them. We don't have real concerns about safety, uh, whereas we know that we have strong concerns about OCS safety. So the benefit risk imbalance is just magic. So if there's really a severe asthma children, personally, and if it was the case of my children, I wouldn't have any hesitation about uh, going to biologics. 
That's excellent. I think uh, a key message here is that to check, as you said, the adherence to the ICS, because many, in many instances, a non-adherence to the baseline ICS therapy is responsible for the need for OCS, which should be avoided, absolutely. Uh, uh, and this is probably one explanation also for the key, for the strong uh, uh, placebo effect in the randomized control trial we discussed uh, in the first question. Absolutely. So I don't have any other questions for now. So I think we'll close uh, the session. Thank you so much for this absolutely wonderful presentation, Arno, and uh, thanks for contributing. And uh, well, uh, have a nice day or, or a nice evening, everybody, and see you for the next webinar. Thank you, Louis Philippe. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.